Good morning, family. Uh, um, just thanking God for everything finally working. Uh, we're going to start as usual, offering up a song of worship to the Lord, and then the apostle will come with the word if God has given it. I pray that all are well. We are excited um, to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the body of Christ this morning. God bless. Breaking out, I have the authority. 
champion God that all things belong to you Lord that we are not defeated because you finished the work at the cross oh God father I pray for our hearing today I pray that the revelation of Jesus Christ would come Lord and be seated in our hearts today and move on us that we would be doers of the word and not just hear it's only God father we petition you today that the spirit of truth would come right now in every place, in every space, in every heart, in every ear, in every mind. Lord, that the word of God would not slip and that it would not fail, but God, because we are in a receptive mode, God. Lord, we thank you for another day, a beautiful morning, Lord, a new day, a new opportunity to experience you, God. Lord, thank you for that which you have given us, Lord. May we not slight it, Lord. May we not be negligent in being and doing the things that you have called us to do. Bless the Lord, all my soul, and all that is within me. Bless your holy name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. 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 Bless God. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name this morning. I praise God. Renee, thank you so very much. Uh, he is our champion. He is certainly my champion this morning. And I give God the praise, and I give him glory, and I give him honor this morning to the King of Kings, to the Lord of Lords, to indeed my champion this morning. God bless you this morning and welcome to another service with his international ministries. It is a delight, yes, even a joy to be with you this morning <clears throat> to praise and worship the Lord our God and to bring the word that I believe that the Lord has spoken to my heart this morning for all of you. I thank you this morning for joining us. We're going to get started this morning. This morning text. Uh, we find ourselves in the book of Matthew, the 14th chapter, with a story that is familiar to many of us. If you are a believer, you may have started to hear this story even as a young child. It's a story, as I begin to read the text this morning, it will be very, very familiar to you. Um, as we have all, most I, I'll say most believers have heard this story time and time again, whether it be when you were younger or as you've gotten older, we've all had some interaction with this particular text. Matthew 14, 22 through 33 is where we're going to go this morning. But before I do that, I need to set the stage, if you will. I need to give you one foundational scripture that will lead us into Matthew this morning. And that scripture is found in Hebrews 11. 
we will read Hebrews 11, verse number one and verse number three as the foundational text to lay the foundation, to lay the groundwork, as you, if you will, as we move into Matthew. And you'll begin to understand why that is necessary once we get into Matthew this morning, once we begin to develop the text this morning. So we begin with Hebrews. And it's Hebrews chapter 11, verse number one. And it says this, it says, Now faith is the assurance the title deed, the confirmation of things hoped for, divinely granted, and the evidence of things not seen, the conviction of their reality. Faith comprehends as fact what cannot be experienced by physical senses. Verse number three, by faith, that is, with an inherent trust and enduring confidence in the power, in the wisdom, and the goodness of God. We understand that the worlds, the universe, the ages were framed and created and formed and put into order and equipped for their intended purpose by the word of God. So that which is seen was not made with things that are visible. That was Hebrews 11, 1 and 3. Now from the Amplified, the story that we're all relatively familiar with, Matthew 14, 22 through 33. This is the story of Jesus walking on the water. And I say, Water, but there is a distinction in the scripture that suggests that it was, it says the sea. He's walking on the sea. And we'll deal with that in just a little bit. I thought that that was a pretty stark contrast as the Spirit of the Lord began to give me revelation on the difference between water and sea. <coughs> Verse number 22, immediately he directed disciples to get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, while he sent the crowds away. After he had dismissed the crowds, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. When it was evening, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was already a long distance from land, tossed and battered by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, that is between 3 and 6 a.m. in the morning, Jesus came to them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear, but immediately he spoke to them saying, take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter replied to him, Lord, if it is really you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the effects of the wind, he was frightened and he began to sink and cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus extended his hand, caught him, saying to him, O ye of little faith, why did you doubt? Verse 32, and when they got in the boat, the wind ceased. Final verse, number 33, then those in the boat worshipped him with all inspired reverence, saying, truly, this is the Son of God. May God add a blessing to the reading, the hearing, and the doing of his word. I'm not going to give you the title this morning until we get to the end of the sermon. 
You may be able to pick it up by the time we are finished today, by the time the Lord concludes this message today. And now faith is the assurance, the title deed, the confirmations of things hoped for. Hope being a feeling of expectation and desire for a certain thing to happen and or occur. Peter had a hope. Peter asked a question of God, and in that question was wrapped a hope, was wrapped a certain expectation. It's interesting that Peter would ask for that, but we're going to deal with that in just a moment. But I wanted to bring that to your attention because there are those of us that are much like Peter this morning. There are those of us that have a hope. There are those of us that have a belief and a desire for something to happen and or occur in our lives, in our situation, in our circumstances. We're going to deal with that hope this morning as we examine what occurred in this particular text, in the context of these verses, these 11 verses, there is a great deal of symbolism. As I begin to walk through this and under the leading of the Holy Spirit this week, I began to realize that there was a great deal more symbolism than I ever realized in this particular text. So this morning we are going to allow the Holy Spirit to show us, to reveal to us, some of the symbolism in the text this morning, there are going to be some things that I am quite sure that the body of Christ does not give any thought to in the midst of this story because there are highlights in this story that we're accustomed to focusing on when we hear this story. But in doing that, you're going to miss some of the symbolism that is in this story. I bless God this morning for the revelation received today and what it will mean and the way that it will impact our lives in doing the word of the Lord. We start in verse 22. To set this up, Jesus has just performed a miracle. Jesus has just finished feeding the 5,000 with meager means. He has just finished that miracle. The disciples, his followers, were a part of that miracle as he broke the bread, as he gave thanks, as he gave the bread to them and asked them to make distribution to the people. They were a part of that miracle. Jesus is just closing that miracle. And verse 22 says, And immediately Jesus told, compelled, made, his followers, disciples, to get into the boat and go ahead of him across the lake to the other side. He stayed there to send the people home. This is the crowd that he has just fed. He tells the disciples to get in the boat. He encouraged them. He invites them. He strongly urges them. He compels them to get into the boat and go to the other side of the Lake of Galilee ahead of him while he remains and sends the multitude, the people that he has just ministered to home. Jesus is in the process of transitioning his focus as he sends the disciples ahead. His focus on dismissing the people, his focus is now no longer on the 5,000 because that need has been met. His focus is no longer on the disciples. His focus is no longer on his followers because that instruction has been given. He shifts his focus now to something that's extremely important for us to understand. He shifts his focus on prayer. He shifts his focus 
on the intimacy that he often enjoyed in his alone time with his father. Needs are met, instructions are given, and he shifts his attention to prayer. But it's noteworthy. It's noteworthy that at this particular point, he is not in the boat. At this particular point, he is not on the sea. Verse 23, and after he had sent them away, dismissed them, he went by himself up into the hills, the mountain, to pray. It was late. And when evening and or night came, Jesus was there alone. Jesus again dismisses the multitude, dismisses those that have had their need met. Now he finds himself in the mountain alone praying. We know that it was late. We know that it was dark. We know that it was night. We know that much. But something that we have to take note of is what this prayer represented, who this prayer was to, how this prayer was conducted. And in order to do that, you have to go over to Matthew 6, 6 and find yourselves in the model prayer. For there you find out what kind of prayer is going on. You find out who he's praying to and how he's praying in Matthew 6, 6. And what's interesting to me is that's the model prayer because it's the same instruction that he gave us in terms of how to pray. He said, when you pray, pray this way. There's something to be said about an intimate, private prayer with the Father. It's something that Jesus often did. We wonder why he was able to do the exploits that he did and walk in the power and the peace that he walked in. I say to you this morning that the foundation of that was the time that he spent with the Father. So he goes to pray. When we look at Matthew 6, 6, it says, and this is instruction to us, and this instruction is in red letters. This is Jesus speaking to us. <coughs> and this is what he says. He says, when you pray, go into your room, shut your door, and pray to your Father. You, your, your. The Father who is in the secret place will hear your prayers. This is important. One of the reasons why Jesus gave that kind of instruction is because he wanted to avoid ostentatious prayers. He wanted to avoid pretentious prayers. There's an understanding that when you go into a mountain alone, when you go into a room and close a door and you're alone, you are with an audience of one. There's no reason to be pretentious. There's no reason. I've met people all over the world that were under pressure when people asked them to pray. I don't know how to pray. I don't know what to pray. It's conversational with God. The reason why people struggle with that it's because others, they watch others pray, and there's an unrealistic expectation on how they should pray, who they should pray to. It becomes performance, and Jesus does not want us to do that. And that's why we're told how to pray. Jesus is not against public prayer by any means. But he knows that when you're in that secret place, he knew that when he's in that mountain, he did not have to deal with the multitude. He did not have to deal with the disciples, but it was intimate time with his father. And we need to understand that this morning. It's interesting to me that in Matthew 6, 6, the Greek translation for the word prayer is proshi komohia. And it means this. The word indicates several things. One, it's a prayer to God. Two, it's a request or invocation. Three, it's in the direction of of God. The need, the need that were met was met of the 5,000 was in their direction. 
The instruction that he gave to the disciples was in their direction. But in prayer, it was in the direction of God. It was a request. It was an invocation of God. That's important this morning. Now, what's interesting is this. When you consider that story, I doubt very seriously that we give much thought to the fact that after he feeds the 5,000, we go, wow, he just feed, is feeding the 5,000. And the next miracle to come, we say, wow. But what we don't realize and what we don't give consideration to as we walk out and try to do the work of the Lord is in between two of the most major miracles that he performed was prayer smack dab in the middle of both of them. He feeds the 5,000 and now he's about to walk on the sea. And in the middle of those two miracles was intimate time with the Father. Don't lose sight of the things that we think insignificant or read over in a, te a text. It's important. Verse number 24. And we're going to move into the meat of this context. Not that prayer isn't because prayer is very necessary. But we're going to move into the crux of the story, if you will. The crux of the encounter, if you will. Verse number 24, by this time, the boat was already far away. Many stadia, and stadia is just a form of measure, and about 600 feet from land, it was being hit and buffeted and beaten by the waves because the wind was blowing against it. Some translation says that the wind was contrary. The winds were against the boat. But let me put some things into context for you. Stadia is a, is, a, is a word that was used back then. Let me give you some context on the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee in circumference is 33 miles. In length, it's 13 miles. In width, it's 8.1 miles. They're not going the length. Of Galilee, They're not going 13. They're going across. They're going with. So they would have gone just over eight miles. If you read in John the sixth chapter, verse number 19, you find out that they were three to four miles in. What does that say to me? What does that say to you? It says they are about in the center of the sea. They're not close to the safety of land on the shore that they left. They're not close to safety on the land to the shore that they were going to. They are in the center of the Sea of Galilee. And they are being buffeted. Too far to reach the place that they came from. Not close enough to reach the place where they were going. They are smack dab in the center of the sea. And they are being buffeted. The boat is being battered. The winds are raging. The boat is being tossed to and fro. But I said to you earlier that there are things about this encounter, there are things about this miracle that we don't give attention to, but we're going to give some attention to it this morning. I'm going to deal with this boat this morning. And we don't have a whole lot of detail on the boat in the context of the text. You can look up and you can study and you can find out about the kinds of boats that were used in that time, fishing boats and other boats and those kinds of things. The one thing that I know for sure from John 6, 19 is that it had to be some form of rowboat because they said they had rowed when the storms began to rage. They had rowed three to four miles to get them in the center of the lake. Ah, uh, but I don't want to deal with the materialism of the boat today. I want to deal with the symbolism of the boat today. The symbolism. I want you to understand, we need to understand this morning what this boat represented. A boat is an inanimate object, and that's what we want to deal with this morning. A boat is not alive. It's not living. So we want to deal with what it represented this morning. What does that boat represent? That boat represented a place of invitation. Verse number 22, you find Jesus, some versions say he commanded them. 
Some versions say he strongly urged them, but there are translations that say he invited them into the boat. So the boat represents a place of invitation. Second thing that the boat represents, the boat represents a place of safety. It's a place where Jesus invites you into. It's a place of safety. You see in verse number 32, and you'll find that after the winds and the waves raged and after the boat was buffeted, they were still safe in the boat. And as we go through this, you'll find that the boat was intact even after Jesus got back into it. So the boat represents a place of safety, saints. Don't lose sight of that. The boat represents a place where Jesus joins us. <laughs> Now, when he initially invited them into the boat, he was not with them. He was not in the boat. He was not on the seas. He was praying. But it does represent a place where Jesus joins us because in verse number 32, after he reaches down and takes hold of, of Peter, they get back into the boat. So he joins them in the boat. He joins them in that safe place. He joins them in that place of invitation. The boat represents a place where Jesus joins us. Here's something of great revelation to me, and it should be to you. The boat represents a place where our faith is developed. It represents a place where our faith is further developed. And we'll begin to see that in verse 31 and in verse 33. Not only the impact on Peter, but the impact on those that stayed in the boat and observed the whole thing. The boat represents a place where our faith is further developed. I like a quote that I had tucked away, away from Smith Wigglesworth. And this is what Smith, a great man of God, this is what Smith Wigglesworth said. Wigglesworth said this, he says, great faith is the product of great fights. Great testimonies are the outcome of great tests. He said, great triumphs can only come out of great trials. Think about that. Think about that in the context of the experience that Peter was about to have. We tend to focus on failure. We tend to focus on little faith. But how much do we focus on the triumph of what actually occurred there that day? How often do we focus on the fact that this is a place where Peter's faith was further developed? Oh, the little faith that Jesus talked about there became the great faith when the Spirit of the Lord descended in the book of Acts and Peter began to speak and many thousand were saved. Oh, but we say, oh, ye of little faith. And we focus on the little faith and we lose sight of the fact that God was developing his faith. Yeah, yeah. Here we are in this boat in the center of the sea. Could it very well be, church, that the center of the sea in your life represents the center of God's will. Could it be the boat that you're in, the proverbial boat of life that you're in that's buffeted, that's beaten, that the waves are crashing against? Could that be? Could it be that you're not close enough to land on one side and you're close enough to land on the other side that you might have to rely on Jesus Christ, that you might have to rely on the Holy Spirit, that you might have to rely on God the Father, that your faith might be developed. Great triumphs, Wigglesworth said, can only come out of great trials. Peter didn't know what he was asking for when he asked that question, but Jesus did. Jesus did. Verse number 25, between, on the fourth watch, between three and six in the morning. It's nighttime. It's dark. What's critical, it says, Jesus 
came to them. He's walking on the sea with purpose. He's coming to them. Fourth watch. It's critical that we understand that it's at nighttime. It's dark. If you look at John 6, 17, it says this. It says it was already dark when they entered the boat. It was already night. It was already dark when they entered the boat. Why is that important to us? Because we have to take a look at the Greek word, skosia, skotia, skotia, meaning dark. Now, this is what is associated with that word, skotia. It represents darkness. It represents gloom. It represents obscurity. A state of being unknown, and that's important. It represents night. Now, the New Testament uses the word metaphorically, and it uses it this way. It uses it to convey an ignorance of divine truth and a lack of spiritual perception. A lack of spiritual perception. This word, the connotation of this word represents darkness, gloom, obscurity. It's night. Jesus elects to come to them in darkness. He elects to come to them at night to demonstrate his sovereignty over natural elements of wind and wave. It's here, it's here that the contrary wind of adversity that God gives Peter and his counterparts the ability to follow him on any wave through any wind to follow him. Jesus is encouraging Peter and encouraging his counterparts Yea, and encouraging us in the 21st century to be adventurous in our pursuit for God. God does not want us to be paralyzed by the fear of the winds and the waves around us. God does not want us to be paralyzed by the situations and circumstances that we find ourselves in. Is the boat of your life being buffeted today? God is saying, fear not. Fear not. I am the God of the wind and the wave. I am the God of the sea. Fear not. Scotia, darkness, spiritual, a lack of spiritual perception. And you're going to find out why that's important here in just a minute. Verse number 26. When the followers, his disciples, saw him walking on the water, they were afraid. They were terrified. They said, it is is a ghost and cried out with fear. They identified him as an inanimate object. They said, it, well, they said it, not an inanimate object. They just said an it. They didn't say he, they said it. It is a ghost. Very well said, maybe ghost live. So it's not inanimate in that regard. He said, they said it, not he, not it is a ghost. Now, this is interesting to me. This is interesting to me because now fear and terror enter the equation. They're in the center of the Sea of Galilee. The boat is being buffeted. The winds are contrary. The boat is being tossed to and fro. We know that. The winds are against it. The waves are crashing. And we see no indication of fear. John gives us no indication of fear. Matthew gives us no indication of fear. That could very well be because Peter was a fisherman. Peter would have had, would have spent many hours on the water. Maybe Peter was accustomed to this. But we don't see any indication of fear as the result of the natural elements. It's only when Jesus begins to walk to them that they fear. Yeah, that's why Scotia is so important. Scotia is darkness. It is gloom. It is obscurity. I can't see. I can't make out what's before me. Scotia is a, an ignorance of divine truth. It's a lack of spiritual 
perception. What they perceived was carnal. What they perceived was natural. And they said it's a ghost. Scotia, dark, gloom, lack of spiritual perception. They didn't know it was Jesus. Their vision was obscured. Is 2020, 2020? Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Oh, they saw some stuff, but did they see? Did they truly see? The lack of spiritual perception caused them to identify Jesus as a ghost. It's a ghost. Scotia. It's darkness. It's night. It's gloom. The storm is still raging. We don't have any indication that the storm had stopped. So the storm has to still be raging. So I can understand obscurity. I can understand it. Three to six in the morning, waves and winds are raging in the center of the sea. Yeah. Jesus uses this experience to further develop their faith. Verse number 27, being the concerned Jesus that he is. But Jesus quickly, immediately spoke to them. Have courage. Then he does something else. He identifies himself. It is I, is what he said. And then he says, do not be afraid. Now this is interesting. Scripture says immediately. It says immediately translates Greek speedily, straightway, directly, quickly. The Greek word describes that which is happening now, right now. So immediately, Jesus says, have courage. Immediately, he identifies himself. He says, I, it is I, and that I translates to I am. It translates to I am, and you know all the things that I am has with it. So he says, it is I, literally, I am. He tells them to take courage. He tells them, do not be afraid. Jesus was not in the boat initially. He was not on the seas initially. But when the need arises, when order is required. Jesus speaks immediately. He speaks immediately. One of the things that we realize here is that faith and fear cannot coexist. So Jesus deals with their fear. He deals with their, their spiritual perception issue. He tells them, don't be afraid. And then he says, it is I. He says, take courage. Well, in verse number 28, Peter, being the spontaneous one that he was, <coughs> says, Lord, if it is really you, then command me, tell me to come to you on the water. Now, that's interesting to me. That's interesting. Not the spontaneity that Peter operated in, because that's who he was. That was his character. So it wasn't the spontaneity that surprised me. What surprised me is the way that he addressed him. He goes from, it's a ghost to Jesus saying in his eye, to him calling him Lord. That Lord translates master. That Lord translates supreme authority. So he says Lord, he says master, he says supreme authority. And then we find the doubt. If it is really you, hmm, I just called you Lord. I just addressed you as master. I just addressed you as supreme authority, and then right behind it I said, but if it is really you, command me to come to you on the water. Peter needed an additional sign. They thought it was a ghost. Jesus identified himself, said it is I. Peter calls him Lord, Master, Sovereign. And then he needs a sign. 
spiritual perception, divine ignorance or truth. How often do we do that in our lives today? God, I believe that that's you talking to me, but Lord, is that really you? God, I believe that you're telling me to bless this person, but God, will you, if you really want me to do that, will you give me a sign? And we'll call him God. We'll call him Lord. We'll call him Daddy. We'll call him Father. We'll do all of those things and acknowledge him just like Peter did. But then we'll say, but if it's really you, if this is really what you want me to do, then go ahead and give me a sign. Peter addresses Jesus as Lord. Yeah. But in expressing Jesus as master, sorry, as master, he also expresses uncertainty and a lack of conviction. He requests Jesus to give him a sign. Well, Jesus being the loving Jesus that he is, here you go, Peter, you ask. Jesus said one word. He said, come. Come. Jesus now extends the invitation that he had given to the safety of the boat out onto the seas. This is his second invitation in this text. The first invitation was for them to get in the boat and to go to the other side. Peter asked to come to him on the seas and he says, come. So now Peter gets a second invitation. Now the invitation to the boat becomes the invitation to the sea. To join him on the seas. Peter obediently leaves the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. There's some things in that context there that you cannot miss. You absolutely, positively cannot miss. Just as Jesus had come to Peter and the other disciples on the boat, as he came toward them, we read that earlier, as he came toward them, when Jesus tells us, as he told Peter, to come, the direction that we walk in is critical. The first part would have been obedience. Peter could have stayed in the boat. But Peter obediently left the boat, so he was obedient. The second thing that's critical that you'll read right over is the fact that he walked toward Jesus. He didn't go to the side. He didn't go to one side. He didn't hang on to the side of the boat. He walked toward Jesus. And that's critical. That's critical. So what we see Peter doing is obediently leaving the safe place that Jesus has invited him to for the, greater, for the place of greater development, for the place where his faith would be expanded, to the place where his faith would grow. Remember what Wigglesworth said? Great trials. Great trials. Here's an invitation to a greater trial than being in the boat, out on the seas. Why is that critical? Because if you know the story, you know that Peter takes his eyes off Jesus. You know that Peter begins to look at what's going on around him. You know that Peter cries out. I say to you this morning this. The importance of you being obedient, the importance of you walking in Jesus' direction is this. When Peter cried out, the fact that he was walking in his direction would have made it easier for Jesus to hear him. The waves and the storm are still raging. Jesus is not by no means hard of hearing. But the fact that, Je that he was walking toward Jesus would have made it easier for Jesus to hear him. The fact that he was walking toward Jesus would have made it easier for Jesus to reach down and catch him. Question this morning, believer. Are you walking in his direction? Or one, are you obedient when he tells you to come? Two, are you walking in the direction that he tells you to walk in? Peter demonstrates the importance of timing. He did not leave the safety of that boat until Jesus said, come. If you're running on your own will, if you're running to your own purpose, slow down, pump the brakes. Do not move. Do not leave the place of safety until Jesus tells you to come. Peter, 
demonstrates the importance of timing. Following Jesus' instruction and direction, now watch this, following his instruction, come, and his direction, come, obligates him to take care of you. If you're out doing your own thing, if you're running in a different direction, if you've gone before he told you to go, you may find yourself on some hardship. You may find yourself in the midst of some battles that, that are self-imposed. You want to follow. You want to be obedient. And you want to follow his instruction and his direction. Verse number 30. But when Peter saw the wind, he became afraid and terrified and began to sink. He shouted, Lord, save me. Now that's interesting because this is the second time that the text says that they saw. But here's what's interesting, and here's a key note that we should take from this particular verse. Peter saw, he saw naturally, he got afraid, terrified, and he begins to sink. And he has the presence of mind to cry out to the Lord that he knew who would save him, to the Lord that he asked for an additional sign. He had faith to believe that Jesus would indeed save him. There's something key about an invitation to leave the safety of a boat and to join Jesus on the water, on the sea. I have, again, no indication, just as I said about all of them before, I have no indication that Peter was fearful before leaving that boat. I have no indication that he was terrified until they saw. In both instances where they saw was when the fear and the terror came in. When they saw Jesus walking on the water, they thought he was a ghost and they became afraid. When Peter saw the winds and the waves around him, he became fearful. Now that's interesting because the winds and the waves did not change. They were the same winds and waves that, that were going on when he was in the boat. That did not change. Here is what's going on. When Jesus asks you to leave the safety of a boat and to join him on the seas, your point of reference, your sight picture will change. And that's what happened. Jesus called, remember we're talking about a greater development of faith. We're talking about greater triumphs that come through greater tests and trials. Oh, there was a safety in the boat. We talked about that earlier. We said that the boat was a place of safety. But Jesus tells him now to leave the place of safety at Peter's request, I might add, and to join him on the seas. Peter's sight picture changed. Peter began to pay attention to these waves and these winds. Took his eyes off Jesus. But what's interesting is he's still moving in the same direction when he begins to sink toward Jesus. Peter saw things differently. It caused him to doubt. It caused him to have fear. It caused him to be uncertain. And in verse number 31, and he does it again. Jesus does it again. The word immediately. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught. I like what the Amplified says. It says he took hold of Peter. Jesus said, your faith is small. What little faith you have, ye of little faith. I'm encouraged today. I'm encouraged today. Because the thing at which we used to ridicule and call Peter out for is the thing that I rejoice in this morning. Jesus didn't say he had no faith. Jesus said little faith. Oh, but we'll quote the size of a mustard seed and we can move mountains. But Peter's ridiculed for having little faith. Jesus did not say he had no faith. What Jesus was saying is he had an underdeveloped faith. 
And what Jesus was doing in calling him out on the seas at his request was developing that faith to a greater faith, to a greater belief. See, Jesus knew something about Peter that Peter didn't know about himself. Remember, he said about Peter, he said, you are not Peter. He said, you are Petros. He said, you are the rock. And he said, upon this rock, I shall build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's who you are. That's who you are, O ye of little faith. That's who you are who took your eyes off me. That's who you are who begins to sink. That's who you are who I reached out, took hold of, and gently rebuked you for doubt and unbelief. Jesus' response to Peter was immediate. He reached out with loving hands. He took hold of Peter and he addressed the doubt. This rebuke is not a crushing rebuke. This is a general rebuke. This is a rebuke of underdeveloped faith, a faith that Jesus knew had to be developed for the things that Peter would ultimately do. Peter, remember, was in the inner circle. He was there for Jairus' daughter's healing. He was there for the transfiguration. He was there in the Garden of Gethsemane. This is the same Peter. Some would say that Peter was the leader of the disciples, certainly in the inner circle, for sure. This is that Peter. This is Petros. This is the rock. This is that Peter. See, we see what we see, and we think 2020 allows us to see all that we need to see. But I say to you that there is an ignorance of spiritual truth. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. There is a void of spiritual perception. Peter and the boys in the boat experienced it, and so do we. So do we. Key thought. Let us consider for a moment, if we will, about our brother Peter. Let us consider the potential harvest of the developed faith as Jesus gives Peter an opportunity to expand that faith. Let us consider the harvest of the souls that will be won over when Peter begins to preach at Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit falls on him and he begins to preach in power and he begins to preach in courage. At this point, his faith has expanded. Let us consider that harvest. Let us look to all of the works that Peter has done. As we begin to bash Peter for a little of faith, look down the road a little bit at what Peter ultimately does for the kingdom of God. Let us consider the harvest of what a developed faith yields. Mark eleven twenty four says this. He says, for this reason, I am telling you, whatever things you ask in prayer, remember Jesus in the middle of these two miracles, what was he doing? He was praying, a prayer directed to the Father. It says, whatsoever you ask, whatever things you ask in prayer, in accordance with God's will, believe with confident trust that you have received them and they will be given to you. If it weren't in the will of God, Jesus would have never told Peter to join him on the water. Peter, Jesus is never going to give you instruction that's outside of the will of God. Peter asked a question. Now, we don't see Peter praying. He was spontaneous. But he asked a question, but in God's grace, in his mercy, he says, come on, I'm going to give you an opportunity to develop this faith. Come on. He said, come. Whatsoever you ask in prayer, confident trust, believe. It's in the will of God. Believe that you have received it. And we're coming close. Verse number 32. After they got into the boat, the wind became calm, stopped, died down. You've got to see this. You've got to see this. We said earlier that the boat was what? The boat was a place of safety. The boat was a place of invitation. The boat was a place where Jesus joined us, and the boat was a place where our faith was developed. Now we see the piece of the boat where Jesus joins us. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, brothers and sisters, let me just say this. Jesus was as comfortable on those seas 
on those seas than he was in that boat. In that boat, he was as comfortable. I found it real interesting that it said he walked on the seas, but Peter was walking on water. Holy Spirit said, "Chuck, you can walk on water. Just spill some on the floor and walk through. You can walk on water." But if you do a study on the seas, you're going to find out that Jesus walked on the heights of the waves. If you've ever been next to a sea, it's one thing to walk through a glass of water, but jump out into the Mediterranean Sea. See, the Sea of Galilee is a relatively small sea, but it, ra it was raging nonetheless. You can walk through a puddle part of water, but jump out in the Med. Jump out in the Black Sea. Jump out in the Red Sea. Jump out in the Caspian Sea. Yeah. Yeah. So Jesus would have been just as comfortable on the seas that he created as he was in the boat. But this, we said that boat was a place that Jesus joined us, right? And here we have it in verse number 32. After they, not Peter, after they got into the boat, Jesus got in with them. So it's a place where he joins them. The wind became calm and ceased. Jesus is now demonstrating his sovereignty over the winds and the waves. They just saw him feed 5,000 and now they're seeing him speak to a raging sea. They're seeing him speak to winds that are howling and they cease. Jesus joins them in safety in the boat. Verse number 33, those who were in the boat, <laughs> they're watching all of this. Those that were in the boat worshiped Jesus and said, truly, you are the son of God. The test of faith on the sea was Peter's experience. Yet the others witnessed the power of Jesus were impacted as well. They worshipped him and acknowledged him as the son of God. I have a note here. If the opportunity to leave the boat is not yours. If the opportunity to develop your faith at that point does not belong to you. Pay attention. Pay attention, just as those in the boat pay attention. Because I can assure you, your opportunity will come. Jesus will give you the command to come, and your faith will be expanded if you trust him. Jesus is still inviting his followers to join him on the sea. And therein lies the title of our message. Join me on the sea. Brother Chuck, that was a lot this morning. What are the takeaways for us? What is it that we need to apply to our lives? What is it that we really need to meditate on? It's brief today. One, Jesus may invite or urge you to enter the boat and go ahead of him. Remember, when they went ahead of him, he was not initially in the boat. It wasn't until they got in to the center of the sea. And we said earlier, could it be that the center of the sea represents the center of God's will for you? So he's still inviting, he's still urging believers to get in the boat. And secondly, Jesus is still requiring his believers to come to him. What is it that represents the seas of your life? What is it that, that the winds and the waves are crashing? What is it that God is asking you, that Jesus is asking you to step out into that causes you to be fearful, <coughs> that causes you to have anxiety? If that's the case this morning, I ask you to change your gaze. I ask you, we said when Peter stepped out of that boat that his sight picture changed. He saw the winds and the waves differently. 
But what God is asking us to do today is to look through the winds and the waves, not Scotia, not in darkness, not in gloom, right? Not with a lack of spiritual perception. He's asking us to look through the eyes of the Holy Spirit today. He's, he's asking us to look with clarity today. Not at that which is going on around you. But to the Father who sets things in order. The winds and the waves had to obey. They had to obey. Because Jesus created them. He set the universe in order. He determined the order. He, deci he decided the purpose for the winds and the waves. That's why Jesus walked on the heights of the seas. That's why the winds would cease when he spoke to the winds. But he's still asking us to come today. Psalms 34, 15, if God asks you to go ahead of him in the boat, go with this assurance. Psalms 34, 15 says, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are hoping unto their cry. Jesus' eyes never left Peter when he got onto that water, and his ears were attentive to his cry. We have that same assurance today. No matter what waves we're on, no matter what boat we're in, the eyes of the Lord are upon us. His ears are open unto our cry. If you, Jesus, Luke in 8, 22 through 25, tells us that Jesus is still speaking to the winds and the waves. That's the story where Jesus fell asleep. They woke him up and they said, they said, Master, we are in peril. We are in danger. He wakes up, he wakes up and speaks to the winds and the waves. They cease, and he gives them the same rebuke that he gave Peter, ye of little faith. Jesus is still speaking to the winds and the waves and the seas of our life today. He is still speaking. He is still rising up against those waves that rise up against us and he is still rebuking them on our behalf. We opened up with Hebrews 11, 1 and 3 and we will close that way this morning. The Good News Translation reads it this way. It says, the faith, to have faith is to be sure of the things we hope. Remember, Peter had a hope. He wanted to walk. The things that we hope for, to be certain of the things we can not see. Church, what they saw is what caused them to fear. Their lack of spiritual perception, their use of their natural sight, 2020, and we don't see any indication that any of them had any vision impairments. So they're they were using 2020 to discern what was going on spiritually. And what wind up happening, it was the things that they saw in verse number 26. It was the same thing that Peter saw in verse number 30 that caused them to be anxious, that caused them to be fearful, to cause them to be uncertain. God is saying the things that you cannot see, the things that need to be discerned spiritually, that's where the peace comes from. That's where the ability to stay the course in the boat when the winds and waves are tossing you to and fro. That's when you have the strength to walk on the seas when Jesus tells you to come. Those things that are buffeting you in your life. Remember that symbolism. The seas are symbolizing those things that are causing you to be fearful. Those things that are paralyzing you. Remember we said earlier, fear and faith cannot coexist. They're diametrically opposed to one another. If you have faith, then fear has to leave. If you're fearful, then you probably have a lack of... No, if you're fearful, you have a lack of faith. But what did Jesus say to them? He says, take courage. He said, it is I. I am. I am. Take courage. And he said, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. <coughs> On that this morning, we close. We close. We close. My prayer today is that when God invites you into the boat, you will be obedient. When God sends you ahead, of, ahead, that you would be obedient. When God tells you to come, that you would be obedient. 
And in that obedience, that you would be confident. That you would walk in the kind of faith that Hebrews 11 says. That you would walk in the kind of faith that Jesus says is yours. Mark 11, 24 said, according to your faith. According to your faith, the things that you pray within the will of God will be granted to you. Now, faith is, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the manifestation and the evidence, the evidence, the tangible, the evidence of things not seen. Jesus said to Thomas, blessed are those who believe who have not seen. We love you this morning. I'm going to invite my wife, Renee, to join me this morning. <clears throat> We're going to, before we do the benediction today, I want to just say that if you're out there this morning and you don't know this Jesus, that we talked about this morning. If you don't know this Jesus that we exalted this morning, if you don't know this Jesus that we trust in confidently, you can today. Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. It's a personal confession. It's between you and God. This is a promise. This is a promise. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes would not perish but have everlasting life. That promise is to you today if you don't know Jesus. That promise is to you today if you've not Ask him into your heart to be your personal Savior. I pray that you would not delay. Today is the acceptable day of the Lord. Tomorrow is not guaranteed. But today, now, when Jesus, it's interesting, when Jesus said immediately, it was what's going on now. This is an immediate appeal. If you've not accepted him, I encourage you to do so today. And if you do that, then we ask that you link with a church, a Bible teaching, a Bible preaching, a Bible believing church, where you can be strengthened and encouraged for the work of the Lord. We thank you this morning. And as we give the benediction, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen and amen. We love you. Have a great week. God bless you. I'm looking forward to the consideration for application. I wanted to say this was loaded and as I listened there were so many things so I encourage you to ready yourself. Uh, I'm not going to tell Chuck this is going to be a two-weeker but <laughs> This is loaded, it's a lot, and it, it was great encouragement to me, and I pray that it was to you as well. So let's ready ourselves for breaking it down and, and learning how we can and how we will apply this thing of faith because we are definitely in the middle of the, the, the sea. Amen. We're, we're definitely Amen. in the middle of the sea. Amen. So I look forward to that, and like Chuck said, we love you guys. God bless, and have a wonderful week. Amen. Bless you.